Hi and welcome to another episode of the Sports Psych Show. This week I'm going to be having a conversation with Professor Sophia Jarrett. Sophia is a sports psychologist who lectures and researches at Loughborough University in the UK. She's an associate fellow and chartered psychologist of the British Psychological Society and she consults with athletes and coaches in a range of sports. Her research work mainly revolves around interpersonal relationships in sport with an emphasis on coaching relationships. And this is what today's conversation is going to be all about – managing and improving relationships between coaches and participants. I'm really excited to be speaking to Sophia because this is a really pertinent area for me and my work and I know having spoken with loads of coaches, hundreds of coaches over the years, relationships is so important to them. So so without further ado, let's get cracking. Sophia, thanks for coming on the Sports Psych Show. Thank you, Dan, for having me. You're welcome. You're welcome. Now, before we get on to talking about uh, relationships between coaches and participants, I know that you've invested a lot of your career in uh, exploring the intricacies of coaching. So I'd be really interested to get to know your definition of coaching or what is the meaning of coaching to you? That is a, a very good um, a question to, to get started. Uh, and it is a question that uh, I only started thinking um, maybe the, the last few years. Um, you know, uh, so coaching for me, what is it? Now, we know um, um, that th- there are proliferation of definitions in the literature about coaching. Yeah. Uh, but m- my definition um, more recently, the one that I put forward, um, revolves around um, this unique relationship that coaches and athletes develop. And I see not coaching, but effective coaching as the combined interrelating between coaches and athletes. As far as I'm concerned, I see coaching as, as a process by which both the coach and the athlete are engaged and invested together. Uh, athletes are unlikely to produce good quality, top-level performances without the direct support and instruction from their coaches. Mm. And Correspondingly, coaches are unlikely to be successful in what they're doing uh, without uh, their athletes' commitment, dedication, talent. And as far as I can see, neither the coach nor the athlete can do it alone. They both need one another. I think that's really interesting, Sophia, because you know, you're engaged in this every single day. And, and I know there's so many coaches globally who would say... Well, hang on. It's about the X's and the O's. It's about te- tactics. It's about technique. Uh, and it sounds to me, I'm, I'm sure you're not going to deny the existence of those things, but it's, it, it, it sounds to me like almost like you put the psychosocial first. It's all, almost as if you know, you're know you defining coaching as, as a relationship business, as a relationship game, if you like. So, so do you put the psychosocial first? Um, I, I, I wouldn't like uh, to risk um, giving um, more uh, importance to um, uh, the, the X and, and O's than um, the, the, the relationship itself. Uh, what I'm just saying is that um, coaches are expected to know their sport inside out. Yeah. Uh, they, they won't be able to coach without knowing their sport really well. But the, the relationship or the... Um, uh, the, the, the effective um, communication and collaboration that exists between the coach and the athlete w- will be the one factor that will enable the X and O's to um, be, be um, um, effective in the process of coaching. Uh, the, athletes and the athletes may not be able to understand the coach and, and what he or she technically, tactically uh, wants to um, to transfer it to them mm. if they are not speaking the same language. Um, so they, they, there is this level of understanding between the coach and the athlete that is necessary, I think, for the coach to be effective, for coaches to be effective when they teach the technical and tactical aspects. So both what to coach and how to coach, for me, is, is paramount 
and, and coaches need to be aware of. That's really interesting. You, you, you talked about the what and the how. So the, the what is something you kind of alluded to. Well, coaches should have a lot of domain-specific knowledge. They should know their sport. So that's, that's the what. I yeah. would always argue that coaches still get wrapped up. You know, you, you, you kind of monitor coaches' communication on Twitter and you hear a lot about session plans and specific activities and that's around the what. But the how, I think, is much more compelling. It's more I- intriguing. And a big part of the how, I hear you say, is, is, is the relationship between that coach and athlete. And I, and I know from, your, from knowing a bit about your work, sort of over the past 15 years, you've really study try to put more meat on the bone when it comes to this coach athlete relationship and I know that you've interviewed hundreds of coaches and athletes and collected a lot of quantitative data from even thousands of coaches and players in a range of sports so what I suppose what took you down that path why did you you're you're a sports psychologist you're you're lecturing on a range of topics uh you made a decision to start speaking to coaches and athletes about the relationship. Why Why that area? I think, um, personally, when I started this work, Dan, um, what I noticed in the literature uh, was that we played, we, we put a lot of emphasis, we paid a lot of attention on, on coaches' leadership. In other words, what coaches do to influence their athletes' um, performance and levels of satisfaction. Mm. And um, uh, leadership, by, its, by definition, is, is really a, a one-directional um, uh, perspective. So it is what coaches do. But uh, my point of view and the way I was looking at this phenomenon um, between coaches and athletes and the way that they work together was that it's not just what coaches do uh, and, and what behaviors they manifest and express, but it's also what athletes do uh, relative to their coaches. And in addition to that, uh, it's not just the behaviors. Of course, we are human beings and we think and we feel. And therefore, uh, our thoughts and feelings are equally important. Uh, and all of these things are inextricably interrelated. So what coaches think about their athletes is likely, uh, is likely to influence how athletes will respond in terms of what they do and how athletes feel about the coach or what coaches um, uh, does to them in order to make them a better athlete or a better person. Uh, is is likely to influence the coach's uh, thoughts and feelings and indeed be- behaviors, and therefore I thought the the coach leadership um, or leadership perspectives were not really capturing the reci- reciprocity, uh, the bidirectionality that exists between coaches and athletes, um, and therefore I, I felt that there was something that we needed to address. Um, scientifically, uh, with the hope that it will impact uh, practice and, and application. Um, and this is how I started, really. And, and so, um, I mean, you've mentioned a lot of really rich um, processes and behaviours in between athletes and coaches there. Um, is this the kind of stuff that you have identified from the research that mediates coach relationship behaviors um what have you identified you've done this 15 years of research what kind of tell me a bit about that research what have you uncovered so uh, the research we have done of the, over the years, uh, like, like you, you said very uh, accurately, uh, we, we have interviewed uh, and we have collected uh, quantitative data as well through surveys and questionnaires, uh, thousands of uh, coaches and athletes' um, data, and uh, the accumulation of that data has led us to develop um, a conceptual, a theoretical model that captures their points of views in terms of how they work together. Uh, and so we have identified that coaches and athletes views um, the, the, the way that they view how they work together uh, is, is a situation, is, is a social situation in which um, uh, coaches and athletes' uh, interpersonal feelings, thoughts, and behaviors are mutually and causally interconnected. And, and those feelings, thoughts, and behaviors are captured in what we call closeness commitment, 
and complementarity respectively. Now, closeness um, captures coaches and athletes' affective ties. So coaches and athletes have told us that what is important um, is trust, uh, it's, it's respect, is, is appreciating one another, liking one another, and, and, and caring for one another. So all of these qualities that coaches and athletes told us over the course of collecting data and trying to understand the um, intricacies that exist between what they do and how they feel, um, revealed that trust, respect, appreciation, liking, caring are very, very important. And these are the things that effectively connect the coach and the athlete. Just with that, I, I, you've mentioned four C's there, and we'll go over each one because I think each one is really interested, interesting and they're obviously interrelated, connected. But with that closeness, I, I, I think that's a really interesting one because you mentioned like, liking, uh, 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 having a relationship where, where the, the coach likes the athlete and the athlete likes the player. Um, I suppose <laughs> from my perspective, in my experience um, there's times where I've encountered coach athlete relationships whereby they didn't necessarily like each other but there was trust from a task perspective so you've mentioned trust and like there's trust from a task perspective so I don't necessarily like this coach or I don't necessarily like this player um, I don't necessarily warm to this player or warm to this coach but I know that this this if we're taking it from an athlete perspective, I know that this coach has a lot of knowledge and so uh, the, the closeness is there. Did the research show that? You are right. Um, our research did highlight on average that liking the other person is important. Uh, in fact, it is important because it makes um, the collaboration and working with the other person just that a little bit easier. Uh, and of course, like you said, yes, we, we don't have to, to like the people we work with, mm -hmm. uh, but liking them, it does help just a little bit more. Uh, and it's, it's not difficult to, to develop uh, this sort of um, affective bond, which is through liking. You know, you just have to find some, uh, some similar uh, interests uh, um, that, that connect you. Um, so if you both like football um, or if you like, um, you know, watching some particular documentary in, in the tell you that that connects you and you you know you develop a, a level of liking for the other person simply because you found something that um it's similar you know and um, so you don't have to force liking uh, yeah. as long as uh, there is trust respect and appreciation but when there is um it is part of the relationship then it makes life a little bit easier for for both the coach and the athlete yeah so that there could be that there can be that affective that emotional bond but if that's not quite there, what, what I think I hear you say is that, you know, just finding some common ground, finding some common interests. Uh, I often hear in my work, coaches and, and, and athletes talk about what they've been watching on Netflix. That, that's right. And I think, you know, the, the more you, we utilize this uh, kind of natural sort of techniques to bond with the other people, then we may naturally develop some liking for the other person because you have found that common ground that connects you. And, and what do you, in terms of the mechanics behind that, so, or, 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 or actually probably more accurately, what does that produce? So let's say, you know, you get on with a player very well. I suppose some coaches might say to you, Sophia, well, okay, so what? I like that, you know, that I like that athlete and that athlete likes me, but that athlete, say in the form of a striker, still has to score a goal. So what that they're close? Does that really make a difference? Actually, closeness, affective closeness, it does make a huge difference whether we, we think it does or it doesn't. And our research has, has really shown strong associations with performance, satisfaction with performance, satisfaction with training and instruction, um, uh, not just, you know, um, outcomes such as, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, well-being outcomes, um, feeling, you know, uh, fulfilled and rewarded as a person, but also very much linked to one's performance. So uh, being close, effectively close with the other person, it does make a difference to going that extra mile, perhaps, you know, um, uh, 
committing a little bit more uh, to the other person. We'll talk about commitment in a little while, but uh, it does make a difference. We may think it's not relevant, but it is relevant uh, to, to performance as well as satisfaction. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, before we move on to that next C, just to put a bit more meat on the bone in terms of that research, um, when you interviewed or the interviews you did with coaches and players, what populations did you interview? Was it coaches and players at a specific level? Was it just the elite level? Was it um, uh, at grassroots? Uh, Was it across the board? What was the level and the age groups that you interviewed? Dan, we have done um, a, a lot, a lot of work. We have published about a uh, hundred articles around coach-athlete relationships. Wow. Uh, we, uh, it, it is just, you know, immense the work that we have done. Uh, and yes, we have um, um, uh, a range of, of, of participants, of samples uh, that partake in the in, in the research we are doing. So from elite, uh, from Olympic level. Um, coaches and athletes to grassroots to uh, county, regional, uh, university, um, student athletes, collegiate athletes. We have um, got the whole range of, of, of levels of performance, uh, types of sports, um, uh, different sociocultural backgrounds. Um, uh, so, yes, it is a, a, a huge variety out there that one can... Uh, have a look at. So, so we're talking about a pretty powerful body of evidence here, basically. So, so what? So we've got closeness. That's that's the first C. And and and, and just to just to say to anybody listening in, you know, that have a think to the coaches who are listening in. Have a think about what personal strategies you are engaging in to help you become closer to your players. And as Sophia has uh, mentioned, it's, it would be great if you like your players and they like you, but very worst way, can you find common ground with them? Can you find common interests? So Sophia, closeness, number one. Number two, what's that second C? So closeness uh, captures, as we said, the interpersonal feelings, um, the affective tone of the relationship, whereas now commitment captures coaches and athletes' thoughts uh, or, if you prefer, intentions to maintain a good quality relationship that is close but also a relationship that has promise, has future, a relationship that will last uh, over time. So commitment is um, is captured in relational properties such as uh, loyalty, um, being able to depend on the other person at this present time, but also uh, having um, a willingness to maintain the relationship over a period of time. And this is important because if you think performance and, and developing skills and, and, and strategies and t- tactics in one sport requires time. So sticking with your coach or, or, or your athlete, is, is, it is important to, to, um, uh, to, to try to do, particularly, you know, as we know, sport is a very volatile environment, competitive sport in particular, where there are so, much, so many ups and so many downs, so many highs and lows. So it is important that coaches and athletes try to maintain that close relationship over time. It's so it is one willingness to maintain a close relationship over a period of time, despite the ups and downs. Yeah, absolutely. And and in your conversations with coaches, what challenges have they put in front of you? Have they said, are oh, that what are their day to day challenges that they experience that either prevent them from? Uh, maintaining relationships or make it very very difficult you kind of said the ebbs and flows of performances is there is there anything else in there that sort of uh, prevents them from maintaining those those uh, really close relationships well of course there are challenges and uh, you know uh, there are situations or events that uh, can destabilize uh, the relationship and um, make people um, start um, 
wondering about the future. Um, so it may be a lack of motivation on the part of their athletes, um, maybe performance slums. Uh, it may be that the athlete doesn't want to commit uh, beyond the, the training session. Sometimes, you know, coaches, you know, require their athletes to do extra training or, or do certain things over and beyond what is required. Where, and athletes might feel um, uh, that these are not necessary or may not perhaps understand the value. So so there are challenges out there um, and, and coaches can overcome, as athletes can overcome those challenges, uh, if um, there is a strong belief uh, that there is something each, um, uh, that, there, that there is something that each one of these, uh, the coach and the athlete can give back to the relationship. Right, something you feel that you can give back to a relationship, Some, something that, um, something personal that you contribute to the relationship. Yes, um, clearly, you know, when there are difficult times and one questions um, uh, the, the, the long-term uh, orientation, um, their long-term orientation toward the relationship, um, coaches and athletes have to question why. Uh, and a dialogue is always important. So if, if the athlete does not want to go the extra mile, it may be that the coach... Um, uh, needs to spend a little bit uh, more time with the athlete to understand their, their needs, uh, their aspirations, their goals. W- what does it prevent that athlete from, from doing that extra that is required? And the same from the athlete. Often athletes feel that their coaches um, do not engage with them for one reason or another. So it is for them to open a dialogue with the coach. And it is important here to say that because relationship is a phenomenon that involves both the coach and the athlete, both of them, we need, they need to be invested. So the coach, for example, may try really hard to engage and connect uh, with the athlete or athletes in, in his team or her team and squad, but all these efforts are not reciprocated by certain athletes. Um, so uh, th- this this is a problem uh, and therefore um, we need to educate athletes that they have to give in the relationship as well. They have to contribute to their relationship as much as their coaches. I think it's sometimes in very, in very crass, simple terms. I think sometimes it's, it's about coaches being great salesmen or saleswomen that you know it, it, it's it's being an influencer uh, as you're speaking there I'm thinking about some of the challenges I've experienced working with uh, soccer coaches at the elite level and um, certainly in in whether it's the Premier League or the Championship in England, some of the conversations I've had, coaches will say to me, well, you know what, the, the, the toughest thing, the, the toughest obstacle Uh, or biggest obstacle with regard my relationship with players is when I have to leave a player out of the team. The reality is that if I've got a squad of 25 players and I'm only taking 15 or 16 to the game with me and I have to leave a, a, a bunch at home and some of them have to start on the bench, then that's often the biggest uh, obstacle in a, in a in a in a soccer coach's relationship with their with their players, um, and and as you're speaking, I, I I think of the conversations I've had with coaches in the past, which is, well, what do you, what else can you contribute to that relationship with that player? You know, it, it it's not just about. Um, picking that player and letting them and allowing them to perform on a Saturday in a match, it's it's if that if that's not possible, then it's what else do I bring to the table? Well, I can help you progress. I can help you work on your game to be the best that you can be. You know, I can give you this opportunity to improve. So I agree with you. It is about finding what you can contribute to the relationship as a coach and then trying to be persuasive in your communication with a player uh, to get them to adhere and to increase their participation and involvement in the relationship. Yes, I agree. And um, I often think um, that... uh, you know, we, we, we do think of selection and this selection as a, as a bit of a problem. Uh, and, you know, it often, like you said, it creates um, 
um, unpleasant feelings from from both sides, the coach and the athlete. But uh, if uh, if uh, the, the coaches and the athletes have got a mutual understanding that. Um, um, selecting you or deselecting you is just part of the process and um, you know uh, the door is never closed it's always half open so you, it is you know on, on your um, it is on your side now the responsibility lies with you if I have not selected you to show me that you have the, the ability and uh, the, the enthusiasm and commitment uh, so that I can I can select you, show me, um, because, you know, I, I'm open. Um, and, and the same for those athletes that are selected, um, you know, unless they prove themselves, uh, you know, uh, uh, over time, the, the door is half open. <laughs> they can just go on the other side. Um, so it's, it's how coaches uh, portray selection and deselection and, and other issues. And... Um, I don't think it's a problem at all. It's again, it's a relational issue to have a, a clear um, uh, understanding of of what we are doing here. You know, the coach's aim is to make the athletes better. Equally, the athlete's aim is to make themselves better, work better for themselves and the team. And um, and therefore, uh, if they have established that, then they can move. Can, they can move on. Selection, deselection is nothing else other than a process, as part of the process of developing, getting better. It's interesting what you're saying there. The way you put that, you know, the, the coach has a responsibility to help the athlete get better. The athlete has a responsibility to get him or herself better to improve, you know, autonomously. Um, and and it reminds me of that that psychological uh, construct locus of control um I th- that's attribution theory isn't it? it it's having that internal locus of control it's the coach saying i'm responsible for these things and i can help this to happen mm-hmm. it's also the player having having an internal locus of control i'm in control of myself i can choose my responses here i can choose my behaviors and it strikes me and i've thought about this before and it would be interesting to get your thoughts on this is that in a in an optimal a uh, sporting environment, perhaps in the elite sense, but also in a developmental sense, that both the coach and the athlete, the coach and the participant, have internal locus of control. There's no external about it. There's we are in we we are in charge of our respective responsibilities. We will work together, but we mm-hmm. can control our what we're doing and our destiny and our on our outcomes. Yes, I, I completely uh, agree. But if, if I may say so, mm. I, I will introduce another concept now mm. and a concept that we often use within coaching, but it has got negative connotations, but I will put a positive spin uh, on it, and that is power. You know, often we assume that the coach has got all the power, but I, I, in my work, I, I can see this power shared, uh, and, and therefore both the coach and the athlete have equal power. And, and the coaches need to uh, appreciate the power that their athletes hold, uh, because if, if, if the athletes understand and appreciate that actually they hold a great deal of power in their hands to make things happen for themselves and for their team and for their coach, then they really can go a long way. So um, within this concept of, of relationships, you know, I can see power being split between the coach and the athlete. It's something that they share together. And, and only if we see it like that, I think they you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the relationship can be at, at its most powerful uh, if we see that both hold power in their hands to make things happen for themselves. But of course, coaches have to allow the athlete to see that, feel it, and 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 suddenly capitalize on it. And and of course, uh, athletes need to take that opportunity and say, yes, I have the power to make things happen for me, um, and um, great things will happen. Power is a very emotional word, isn't it? It's full of affects. It's very uh, evocative and and, uh, and 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 can provoke. And, and uh, as you're speaking there, I'm thinking of the the look of fear running over some coaches. Perhaps, again, perhaps more so the, at the elite level. But I'm, I suppose I'm very sad to say that some coaches at young uh, developmental 
um, age groups would also be fearful of that notion of sharing power, of this idea of, now, I'm not in charge. I'm co-creating solutions here. You know, I have ideas. I'm going to offer choice. Um, I'm going to facilitate. I'm, I'm going to share um and i i don't when when you when you've mentioned that notion of power and sharing power between coach and athlete um have you had much pushback from coaches have have you seen that look of fear <laughs> sort of uh, 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 uh envelope their face if you like uh, maybe they haven't admitted <laughs> to it uh, but um no, I, I think, you know, in the context where um, where I'm talking or I'm coming from, uh, perhaps it is, uh, it, it is understood. Uh, but, you know, in contemporary sport, you know, in modern sport in, today, things are very different for, from how they were 20, 30, 40 years ago. And we have to appreciate that. And, um, you know, power is, is one of those things that um, they, they have... You said uh, you know it is very emotive and uh, you know it, it can it can uh, raise the eyebrow of the coaches, but the power itself can really move things. And um, I, I believe it is something that the coaches can capitalize. But of course, um, it, it can be abused uh, and misused, uh, and we have to be careful. Um, in a in a context where you know the relationships between coaches and athletes have all the ingredients of trust, respect, appreciation, um, you know commitment, you know great levels of collaboration. Everybody's on 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 the same wavelength, on the same you know page. Uh, allowing power to the athletes, uh, I think it can be very very powerful for both the coach and the athlete. But when you know things are breaking down. Uh, and then we talk about athletes' power, then things can go really, um, you know, in, in a way that perhaps neither of them wish. Uh, so we need to be careful. I, I speak about power within a context that is very positive, harmonious, healthy, uh, and, and they both move into, you know, the right direction. Yeah, it's it, it, again it, as you're speaking now. I'm, I'm thinking of the, the the power coaches have to empower uh, players to find solutions to experience uh, moments of leadership and character building and 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 all these kind of really important personal social characteristic traits and and i almost think there's actually a, a paradox there in as much as when coaches wield this this uh when they wield power from an autocratic in an autocratic way then actually they give power to players in a negative way because the then uh, then uh, players are empowered to moan and and groan behind coaches backs and talk amongst themselves about how bad things are whereas what you're saying uh, in this positive power way, this, this 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 shared power, is when a coach wields his or her power to empower players, to join him or her uh, with progression and performance and 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 in training sessions, then then um, I think that's just a very positive way of looking at power. Yes, it's for the greater good. Power for the greater good. I think that's how I will describe it. And you know, I, I don't. I don't think I have any any more to say at this point, other than, you know, maybe coaches as they listen and athletes as they listen to the, to our conversation, they consider it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We move on to a third um, um, C. Uh, what would that be? Okay, so uh, the, the next C is complementarity. Uh, or if you prefer cooperation. Uh, so um, cooperation reflects uh, coaches and athletes 
cooperative acts of interaction, everything that coaches and athletes do uh, uh, to, to, to work with the other person in, in the best possible way. So, um, and within that, um, if we call this third C cooperation, uh, we, we have two, two sets of behaviors that are very important. The first set of behaviors, uh, interpersonal behaviors, capture um, behaviors that both the coach and the athlete uh, we expect to, to express during training and competitions. For example, responsiveness is one. So you expect both the coach and the athlete to be responsive, uh, to be um, uh, adapting a, fr- a friendly attitude uh, to one another, uh, to be at ease and comfortable in um, each other's presence, and um, to be relaxed. So these are, you know, positive interpersonal behaviors that you expect um, both a coach and athlete to, uh, to, to have in training and competition. The other, sets of, uh, the other set of behaviors uh, characterize and capture, in fact, coaches and athletes' distinct roles. Uh, so coaches and athletes take different roles within the relationship. Uh, and at large, you know, uh, you will expect the coach... Uh, to take the role of of a leader, someone who is able to direct, orchestrate, instruct. Uh, whereas the uh, from the athlete's point of view, we'll expect uh, the athlete to be able to filter uh, the information that he he or she um, uh, gains um, uh, and um, execute the instructions and and the information that uh, he he or she is provided. Um, So here we capture uh, the roles that coaches and athletes take in the relationship. You mentioned that, you know, within cooperation, uh, this notion of athletes being relaxed with each other, enjoying each other's company, perhaps I'm slightly paraphrasing there, excuse me if I am. No, that's fine. Um, I... I yes, and 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 that to a degree has been my experience. I I suppose there is this branch of thought and philosophy within elite sport and developing elite that um, we want to visit this sort of zone of uncomfortable, and that great coaches help athletes feel uncomfortable and strive to to be comfortable in an uncomfortable environment and perhaps even athletes can help other athletes you know you might say somebody like a Michael Jordan um, a Roy Keane more latterly uh, would take uh, other uh, participants uh, in their team in their group out of their comfort zone how do you, you may agree you may disagree how how does that sort of relate to your research there yes um i i think you know the 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 coach is expected to challenge uh, the athlete absolutely definitely that is very true and within cooperation uh, that will um transpire from coaches um leading uh, in a particular way, directing and, and guiding, because yep. this is part of, of them instructing and, and really laying out the expectations and, and how we work here. And, and athletes, um, um, correspondingly, appreciating, understanding that we are expected to really go uh, beyond our comfort zones. Um, th- this is how uh, this is this is how we operate in in, in this team environment uh, sport um, and, and therefore i'm happy with that um, and as i said it is probably captured within the set the second set of behaviors um, that we expect the coach to to challenge the athletes and uh, and direct and lead you know after all the coach will have the upper hand you know the, the, there's no other way yeah, and I, and, I, and I suppose there's different ways to challenge athletes, isn't there, Sophia? I mean, I can, I can stretch uh, an athlete, take him or her out of their comfort zone by the tasks I set, not just by my language, but 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 I can I can design tough to attain uh, or tough to achieve activities that really stretch them, and then I can support them with my voice. Um, and also I can stretch them with my voice, with my communication, which I, I know we'll speak about communication in a bit. So so I agree. I, I think it's a very interesting la- and slightly complex landscape, that one. And, and I think 
if I may say, I think sometimes there are examples of athletes on teams who might be construed as engaging in maladaptive behaviour that really takes... and. I, you know, as a psychologist, we try not to speak about uh, athletes without them being present. But I, I suppose if you take somebody like Roy Keane, he would actually revel in the notion that he verbally takes others out of their comfort zone and um, leads them as a teammate in this way. So it, it wouldn't be unethical for me to sort of mention him. And, and I, I, I think certainly you could say that he was he would have been back at Manchester United and, 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 and sort of 10, 15 years ago, having spoken to people who were in that environment at the time, they, they, when I've spoken to them about this, they'll look at me and, and give me a knowing look and go, yeah, that guy was really tough on his teammates. Mm. Uh, and so, and I think in some environments, so tough, in fact, that it could be seen as maladaptive. It might have jeopardised his relationship with some, mm-hmm. but... The players there at the time were able to just say, hey, that's just Roy driving us. We'll accept that. Yes. Um, yeah, sometimes it depends, on, like you said, depends on, on, on the culture. You know, mm. uh, Manchester United has got a specific culture, uh, the values and purpose, yeah. um, uh, you know, and... Uh, uh, a very powerful uh, man- manager um, who, uh, you know, um, uh, pulled the strings in certain ways. And uh, if that behavior was acceptable um, by the majority, then, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it will be, you know, it is part of the culture and part of, of um, uh, how that uh, team is defined and it's acceptable and, and it is not maladaptive. It is just simply, you know, how we do business here. Well, as I, to use your language, it's, it's cooperation, isn't it? You know, they're, yeah. they're cooperating to come out of their comfort zone. So, yeah. so fascinating stuff. And, and what would that fourth C be? The fourth C is, we call it co-orientation. And um, uh, it captures coaches and athletes' levels of similarity and understanding, particularly uh, within the context of their relationship. So, do um, coaches and athletes view their relationship, the relationship that they have developed in, in similar vein, in, in a similar way? Um, and if so, that, that, is, that is great. They have a common understanding, which may spill over in other areas like goal setting or um, the ways that they uh, train and uh, the things that they want to achieve uh, together and separately. So uh, it, it captures the level of of, uh, of similarity and understanding between coaches and athletes as they view um, particularly uh, their own relationship. And and as I said, they, they may view the relationship very similarly, uh, which is which is good. It's it's effective, uh, but they may be um, viewing their their relationship very dissimilarly. Uh, or they may there may be a degree of disagreement. So you may have a coach that thinks that um, uh, we we trust in one another, we are supporting one another, we are working well with one another. There is a great collaboration. But you may have the athlete of that coach thinking completely the opposite. There is no trust. There is no respect. The collaboration is not quite there. And then you have to question, you know, why there is that disagreement, this disorientation in the ways that they view their relationship, which may spill over in other areas of, of, of the work that they do together. Um, so we need to be very, very careful if there is a, 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 a perceptual a disor- a disorientation or disagreement, uh, why is it and how we can move these people's um, perspectives in a way that they can start viewing things similarly again. That's really interesting, Sophia. So as again, as you're speaking now, I'm, I'm kind of thinking, well, does that suggest that there can be a lot of instability in relationships? You know, that that doesn't strike me as a C, this co-orientation. It doesn't strike me as a C that's particularly stable, that it can change on a, a, a month by month, sometimes a week by week, even a day by day basis. And, and that uh, these relationships can be unstable and, and coaches and athletes, but coaches need to be very aware of that. So they need to be very um, uh, d- d- conscious and self-evaluate their relationships with players all the time. Is that what you discovered from your research yourself? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You, 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 you are absolutely right. The, the relationship um, 
as we define it and describe it um, through the research we are doing, is that it, it's, it's a situation, a situation that can change. Uh, you know, there may be a, a whole host of um, uh, events that can destabilize the, the quality of the relationship. So it may be success, uh, failure, uh, it may be burnout, injuries, um, a, a whole host of things, selection, deselection. So uh, this can, can really affect the relationship from, um, you know, um, you know, one month to the next. So yes, you're right. Coaches need to be, and athletes need to be aware of where they are with the, their relationships. And if if they change uh, for better or worse, um, they need to 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 pay attention. And and great 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 phrase, pay attention. Um, because I think sometimes we, we walk through life and we walk through our coaching lives without necessarily being conscious uh, of them. And, and just that very notion of, look, pay attention, pay attention to your relationships. And do you think, Sophia, just engaging in just basic self-reflective behaviors, just even if it's just a few minutes a day, just r- retracing your steps or uh, evaluating the thoughts, the feelings and the behaviors you engaged in in training with relation to your athletes or vice versa can help just even if it's just five minutes in the car on the way home yes of course yes uh, it will help to um, to reflect uh, evaluate assess um, the relationships uh, one has with uh, with their with each one athlete in the team or squad and i know it is very difficult particularly when you have a team or, or a squad of, of 30 plus um, hopefully you've got assistant coaches who can you know uh, take part in the process of developing and maintaining uh, relationships because after all you know we all need to um, uh, to feel connected and to feel that we belong to so uh, we need to ensure that all athletes have got this sense of connection whether it is with the principal coach or with assistant coaches uh, coaches need to uh, to ensure that this is the case and, and you know relationships uh, do take time to develop and um, once they develop they need attention uh, you know, over a period of time and, and to um, particularly, you know, times where they are difficult and hard uh, for, for, for either members of the relationship. Um, but essentially, um, I, I often say to coaches, you need to keep the finger on the relationship, uh, on the relationship pulse. On a relationship pulse. Nice. Yes. I like that. Yes. Okay. So, four C's. And I know out of your research that you, you've come away with some communication strategies as well, I believe. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about those communication strategies? Okay, so um, the, the four C's uh, that we mentioned earlier define or describe one's relationship quality. So, um, you know, it, it is the, the bare bones or, or the, the frame where one builds a good quality relationship. Now, um, the relationship I often actually call it is, is the vehicle, you know, the relationship, the four C's, um, is a vehicle that takes coaches and athletes from place A to place B, and B is a better base. Now, if the relationship uh, is, is the vehicle, we need to fuel it. Uh, and communication uh, is what fuels relationships. Okay. So uh, we've got um, uh, communication strategies or relationship strategies to help us uh, develop and maintain better relationships. And uh, these uh, um, strategies are evidence-based. Uh, we asked the coaches and athletes uh, of different levels of sport, different types of sport uh, from different age groups, um, to tell us how they, you know, they develop, they interact, they communicate with their coaches so that they um, develop a sense of connection with them. So um, the, the model I'm referring uh, to is COMPASS, and COMPASS start for, um, stands for seven strategies. Uh, the first strategy is conflict management. Now here I'd like to stop and, and just say that um, um, conflict is inevitable. Uh, conflict will happen in, 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 in even the best relationships uh, between coaches and athletes Um, and therefore we need to be mindful when conflict occurs whether it is a simple disagreement a misunderstanding uh, an incompatibility of some sort we need to uh, to stop and check 
and um, it's in our work uh, that we have recently uh, conducted uh, around conflict between coaches and athletes, uh, we, we need uh, not to try to avoid conflict, but we need to approach conflict. So conflict management is very important and reflects efforts to identify, uh, discuss, resolve and monitor conflict. When an athlete and a, a coach are engaged in any kind of conflict, um, you, you've mentioned a sort of some overarching principles there, but are there some specific, if we drill down, are there some specific strategies that that help um, overcome conflict? Um, is there a way to ease tension? Is there a, a way for, a, say, if, if we're looking from a coaching perspective, for mm-hmm. um, a coach to just manage that situation in that moment? Sure. Um, there, there are ways of of uh, dealing with the conflict. So, um, uh, and in fact, there are five five ways in literature that one can can deal with conflict uh, or manage conflict. So, accommodating is one. Uh, so, giving the other side, the the coach or the athlete, what uh, he or she wants. Yes. Uh, so accommodating is, is one way, and depending on the situation, uh, it may be that accommodating is the right choice, mm. uh, but it's not always the right choice. Um, it may be that uh, because of the situation, the coach and the athlete decide to avoid conflict. So it's really, you know, um, putting off co- putting off conflict indefinitely. So it may be for that situation, for that particular conflict, putting it off uh, or delaying it or indeed ignoring it is is the best strategy. Um, but we need to be uh, quite careful when we avoid and when we accommodate. Yeah. Um, another um, uh, management technique is is collaborating, and that is a quite um, relationship friendly um, management um, conflict management technique. Um, where here, you know, the coach and the athlete try to integrate ideas of resolving, managing conflict. Um, I, I, I like that. Sophia, because I, I, I'm kind of picturing you know, probably from the past when I've seen it in when I've seen conflicts in progress, and and often you, you find that you know from a but arguably from a neurological perspective, uh, when people are in conflict, their limbic system is firing, and the the the, the intellectual brain shuts down, and 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 it's all very emotional. Whereas you know, I think when a coach and or an athlete can say. I hear what you're saying, and much of what there is, there is, as an example, there is much uh, true about what you're saying. You know, there is much to be said about what you're saying. This is my perspective. How can we join these perspectives here? Seems to be a very mm-hmm. rational way of, of, of potentially moving forward in any kind of conflict. That, that's correct. That, that is the essence of collaborating. It's that uh, we find a, a creative solution that works for everyone, I guess. And, and have you got any more uh, little golden nuggets for, for conflict management? Okay, and uh, two more uh, that uh, people may want to mm. consider when they are in situations of conflict. Uh, competing is another one. Uh, competing is um, a strategy uh, that we utilize often um, and hopefully in limited uh, situations uh, when um, there is a crisis or emergencies. Um, And of course, uh, in these situations, you only have one person that wins, the other loses. So uh, a competing uh, management uh, style um, uh, when conflict arises is that there is only one winner. And I will move on to the last one, which is uh, compromising. Okay. So both sides of the conflict give up elements of their own position Mm. uh, and um, they establish an acceptable and agreeable way to um, move forward. So compromising is is probably um, another positive um, uh, solution and uh, usually takes place when both relationship members um, share power. Going back uh, to what we were talking about earlier. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's definite relationship with power. So, so conflict management is is the C of of compass. What's the O? 
O is openness. So here we, um, the, the strategy that coaches and athletes often use is uh, to disclose information, to be open about information that may affect both the, the performance, uh, the training, the competition, uh, but also um, one's um, uh, personal life. So sometimes, uh, for example, um, uh, athletes may need to share their personal information. For example, there is too much work or um, they had some disappointment at home uh, that they need to share with their coach because it will affect um, the, their performance or, or their training in one way or another. So being open is, is very, very important. Disclosing information is very, very important. But at the same time, openness won't happen until you, we have established a level of good quality relationship. Uh, th- there is some trust and respect uh, between uh, the, the relationship members. So it's um, openness includes conscious efforts to engage in exchanging information that is valuable um, for both parties. Interesting. And it's relevant. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and so we've got the C, we've got the O, conflict management and openness. What's the M? Motivation. Motivation highlights coaches and athletes' efforts to make a partnership that to make a partnership a collaboration that is rewarding, motivating, satisfying, ambitious, and dynamic. So it's um, athletes and coaches here uh, communicate their motivation to work with one another, and it may come in many different ways, of course. And there are so many, um, uh, um, so, so much literature in our field about motivation that one can use. So it's, uh, it kind of links up with motivational climates, the task and the ego motivational climate. Task, of course, it's much more uh, effective and positive than ego. Uh, but it links with uh, this sort of uh, literature that uh, uh, you only already know, I'm pretty sure. Well, yeah, but, you know, to, to speaking out to the audience, I mean, that, that, that that's brilliant, Sophia, and, and, and I would direct the audience towards some of the, the podcasts I've done already with Lara Mossman and, and Martin Turner, Dr. Martin Turner, um, who did REBT. We, we, we spoke a lot about self-determination theory and uh, goal achievement. So I think that's it all it all comes to the same same thing, the same point. So what would the P encompass be? So the P is preventative uh, strategies, and these strategies underlying efforts to discuss expectations. So it is very important for the coach and the athlete, particularly in the beginning of the season, for example, to highlight uh, the, the expectations. You know, how do we work uh, here? What are what are the our roles and and, and responsibilities? What are the rules? And um, of course, what should happen if uh, expectations are not met, uh, or if the rules and the roles that we were supposed to to um, to maintain uh, are not being maintained. So preventative uh, strategies are there to keep you in the straight and narrow. And um, often, whether coaches do it or not, I'm not quite sure. But it is important to highlight from, right from the start what one expects, what one wants and desires within the collaboration, within the team, and so on and so forth. Look, I, I think that's so important, Sophia. I mean, I, th- I think of group norms. I, th- I, I think of, um, I think of values. I think of the behaviours, and that can be player-driven. That can be athlete-driven, can't it? You know, a coach can be in a room with athletes, with players, with participants, and and empower. Again, we come back to that power. Empower them to come up with the group norms, the behaviours, the values. What are our values? What behaviours underpin those values? What are we going to normalise in our culture? What are we going to do and engage in? So, uh, I, I just that's so so pertinent to me that you know you describe it as preventative and I really like that word because I think it as you as you're alluding to it it, it, it prevents the conflict it prevents things from going right it doesn't it doesn't completely obliterate that possibility but it does lessen the chances doesn't it it does absolutely yes uh, preventative is, is good and it, it does happen but perhaps it needs to be more consciously um, uh, hap- uh, you know more consciously to, to happen and monitored over time as well so the next um, is assurance 
benefits and includes showing one's commitment to the relationship. Now, it may be quite pertinent to ask coaches how do they assure their athletes uh, that I'm here for you, I work for you, uh, and we are together in this. Um, there are simple little things that one can do. Um, I often say to the coaches, uh, do your athletes have your telephone number, your email? Do they know how they can reach you if there is a need? Uh, and the same goes for, for, um, for the athletes. Uh, they, they, you know, this is sort of, you know, understanding we um, – are in it together uh, and making sacrifices, assuring the other person that, you know, I, I want to invest uh, in, in this relationship. I want to do the best that I can do so I can make the relationship and the work that we are doing together purpose, purposeful, functional and successful. It's simply assuring the other person you are next to them. And it's almost cliche to say now, isn't it, it's a Sophia, in, in, in coach and athlete relationships that you know, knowing, knowing their family members, knowing their birthday, uh, knowing little personal tidbits, it, it can be so important because it just, it just helps that, that, that athlete, again I'm coming from a coach perspective here, it just helps that athlete feel so much better about themselves and so much better within their environment and within the relationship. So what's the, the, the next uh, communication strategy? So next we've got uh, support. Uh, we've got two S's at the end. Uh, one is support and the other is social network. So support is reflecting in, help, in helping, in simply supporting one another um, through difficult times. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it can be um, support that is emotional, support that, uh, it, you know, a, a simple pat on the back when you feel a little bit low uh, or a little jo joke that can lift uh, the spirits of the other person. Uh, it may be informational. Uh, it, it may be that um, the athlete, the coach needs some information and uh, you, you are open to, to provide that and uh, it may be tangible support that one needs um, and that can also be uh, available. Fantastic and so uh, are those, the t does that encompass the two S's on the end of, of compass? Then the next one, the last one, is uh, social networks. And um, we, we have to remember that the relationship between the coach and the athlete or the many relationships that coaches develop with their athletes uh, is not, uh, is not, uh, are not in a vacuum. Uh, they, they are developed within a much broader, broader network. And you mentioned about parents and, and, of course, other coaches, other athletes, the physios, you know, the, the, support, the support staff that uh, um, um, surround the, the coaches and the, the athletes. And these are important to to be there uh, and, and help the relationship and, um, uh, you know, uh, connect with, with the coach and the athlete. It's a system, isn't it? It's a complex it system. It is a system. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. Re it really is. And, and it's amazing how one, one incident, one behavior, one event can have a knock-on effect, both, both positive and negative, within that system. And so understanding relationships... Uh, within a system, um, I think is, is is whilst it might feel like whoa, that sounds quite complicated. That's the reality of coaching, isn't it, Sophia? At, at least it is for me. Is that there is an element of co complication here? Um, but but what I love about what you've done, uh, you know, over the last fifteen years, so interviewing and building quantitative data. What you've done from an empirical perspective is turn a very complex and complicated, because there's a difference between complex and complicated. I, th I think that it's, with people, it, it is both, in my opinion. You've turned this very complex and complicated relationship area between coach and athlete into something uh, that, that is much more tangible. And... I know that you've got uh, uh, you've brought this together, the compass communication areas to, uh, and and the four C's of the coach athlete relationship, and you've created something called called Tandem, I believe. That's a relationship tool. Yes, Tandem is um, um, uh, packages. Tandem packages uh, all the evidence uh, that we have um, generated over the past so many years um, in one web app. So uh, athletes and coaches can go on um, www. 
tandemperformance.com and um, they can find a lot of information about a coach athlete relationships, about communication. There are lots of resources, okay. but they can also, um, uh, they also have the opportunity to uh, assess and evaluate uh, tangibly uh, the, uh, the, the relationship quality they have developed with, um, you know, athletes, coaches and so on. So this is um, uh, an enterprise project that the university has uh, taken uh, on and it's available for all coaches and athletes across the world to to, um, have a look and have a go. it, it, what, what the beauty of that is that it's uh, at the back of evidence. So uh, the, the results that generates, um, one can place confidence on. And so everyone, that's at Loughborough University. So that's the, uh, as I'm reliably informed um, across the industry, that that is the number one sports university in the world, not just in the UK. So I, I thoroughly recommend that, that people go and do that. Absolutely. Uh, look, thanks so much for your time. This, this has been... I've I've taken two pages of notes here, so I, I'm I'm now eagerly going to sort of condense my notes and and use it in my consultancy. I I, I know that this has been so informative, and I, I'm as I said to you at the beginning, I want to stay in touch with you. So, how can other people? How can people find your work? Well, I'm available on the um, on the web. Uh, I have a Twitter account and. Um, uh, I've got an email. Uh, I'm very approachable, very open. I want to hear from uh, from people, so uh, get in touch. What's what's your Twitter handle, Sophia, and what's your email address? At Jawed Sophia Twitter account yep. and my email address s for sugar dot Jawed at elboro dot ac dot uk. Perfect. Thank you so much. That was Professor Sophia Jarrett. Thanks so much to Sophia there. If you enjoyed that, please do leave a rating and a review. And don't forget to subscribe to the Sports Psych Show to be alerted about future episodes. I look forward to next week's episode. Bye for now.